we are currently in a study uh, on the life of Elijah, and I want to emphasize we're only going to study the first phase of his life. We're only studying the period of, of his ministry and life dealing with the reign of Ahab. That will take us uh, chapters 17, 18, and uh, first Kings, of course, 17, 18, and 19. But th the reason is I want to deal with God sent the drought to bring a spiritual awakening in Israel, the priest nation, the divine agency, the custodians of the word of God, evangelism, uh, to awaken them to a spiritual uh, reformation. <clears throat> and so I thought that was important because, because of the crisis they were in. Uh, we're in one called the COVID-19 virus. And I thought there's very, there are a lot of similarities for us to gather from this in my opinion, uh, from this study, we know definitely that God sent that three and a half year drought. Elijah went in and said, God has sent me to tell you that you need to do away with idolatry in the priest nation of Israel and return to the worship of Jehovah God of Israel, the Lord God of Israel. And uh, Ahab chose not to do it. And so they went through a three and a half year a drought crisis, uh, life and death, just like we're going through. And that uh, brings me to last week's study. You recall from last week's study that <clears throat> Obadiah, who was on the advisory board of King Ahab and the top advisor, uh, one of the few men that had the ear of King Ahab was a guy called Obadiah, and he was a statesman. And the reason Ahab had him on his team is that he was a very popular statesman in the nation of Israel. I mean, he, was a, he had the people. And Ahab to reign needed the people. And so he was, he, and you'll see that and, uh, in him. And so Elijah has returned from uh, the Mediterranean coast uh, line uh, from Z Zarephath, as we know, has returned uh, to have a special meeting with King Ahab to say, we need to move to a spiritual reformation. And o Obadiah is on his way to have a, a, an emergency meeting on the, well, at least it appeared to be, on the crisis problem they were having from the drought when Elijah suddenly appeared to him en route while, while uh, Obadiah was en route to the king and told him, he said, listen, yeah, I need to have you tell the king I want a special meeting with him and I want it today. <clears throat> this is an emergency. I need, the, I need to have a conference with him. And, of course, you remember the conversation with Obadiah. <laughs> Obadiah, that was not good news for Obadiah to have to go to the king and tell him that Elijah, and he don't know where Elijah is because Elijah is not with him, and so he was fearful that the king might kill him, but he went and did it anyhow because God is greater than any, any human in the divine system. And so Obadiah, uh, a really a key, a key figure in the reign of, of Elijah. I mean, a lot of times, if it wasn't for the scripture, we would not even know of this man. And this man was, you know, listen, he was the guy who had, uh, who had a hundred prophets when Jezebel went on a killing spree. And killed all the others. And uh, it was quite a guy. And then when, his, when, we, when he met with uh, Elijah, they taught doctrine. I mean, they were on the same page. It's just an interesting guy. We would have never known about him had it not been for this uh, in the scriptures. And so I find Obadiah a very interesting figure. You always got to have Obadiahs. In a special re re reformation, you always got the lead guy who is the spiritual guy. You always got a Luther, but he alone can't do that. And so you always got to have that statesman. And every time God led a reformation, he always had states, statesmen who had the same view of the, uh, a similar view at least of the guy leading the reformation, the spiritual reformation. Well, it's well worth your study in history to take a look at that and keep it. So we got, so what God wants is three guys to start a, he, he is, he's given the drought 
three and a half years to bring a spiritual awakening. Now he wants to see if there's enough people in Israel that are willing to start a spiritual reformation. And so he, God is ready. And so he, he, he's got two of the three. He's got Obadiah and he's got Elijah on the same page. They need King Ahab. They need King Ahab to do this. And so the, a meeting from last week, a meeting. Now, what, where we are today is in 1 Kings 8, chapter 18, verses 17 through 29. And it's part of the meetings of beginning a spiritual reformation. And we, it's wonderful because you can actually get to see it operate. Uh, kind of like an inside, a bird's eye view, as they might say. And so today we're going to look at the beginning of a spiritual reformation. Uh, they're going to have that meeting. Obadiah is going to set that meeting up with King Ahab and Elijah. And, uh, and it will begin a spiritual reformation, the beginning of it in Israel. A parallel passage, well worth your read when we're studying idolatry, a parallel passage that you should read is 1 Corinthians 10. That's a parallel passage to this lesson. And it was, of course, to the church of Corinth. And what an interesting similarity to the ministry of Paul uh, when he writes. And I would like you to pay special attention uh, to verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. In verse 11, Paul says something that's important for you and I when we study this. It's a passage like this that drives me to look at the crisis we're going through, to look in, the, in, in Scripture to see if there, there ha, has there been anything similar to this and what can we learn. Now, Paul tells you to do that. Uh, well, let's just, let's just go there. Let's go to first, then I'll have a word of prayer. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. And this is what motivated me. This is what motivated me to do the life of Elijah uh, during the reign of King Ahab through the drought and the spiritual awakening and reformation. In, in, in verse 11, he says, now these things, and he's talking about, he's talking about the old covenant. He's talking about things that came out of the old covenant. It, you could go back and read the first nine verses, how God dealt with Israel. In verse 11, he said, now these things happen, and he's gone through several things. He said, now these things happen to them, Old Testament believers. As an example, they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And he goes on and he talks about verse 12, 13, and 14, uh, about idolatry. Okay? So we have these things in the Old Testament, they're for our example and for instructions for us under the new covenant. There are great lessons to be learned for us as believers, for the church. And so that's the reason I chose to do what I'm doing, just to give you a background to my preparation uh, for the study of Elijah phase one. I don't know when I'll do the other, but I'm after phase one. Well, let's... let's Let's go get our passage. Let's go to 1 Kings. Go back here to 1 Kings. Let's get our text. Samuel King. 1 Kings 18. I just want us to get it open. I'm going to begin with verse 17 today. Well, we could actually make it 16 as a review. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. In verses 17, we're going to go through 17 through on our paper for verse 29. I'm not going to study it right now, but we will study it. That's the passage we're after to look today, the beginning of a spiritual reformation. And that's really important that we see that. Well, let's, let's open with a word of prayer. Remember, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is per, of, of personal sin. That's the evidence. 
It could be mental attitudes, sins, sins of the tongue, or overt sins. How do I get out of carnality in the church age? How do I get out of carnality and back into spirituality, which is the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, inside the body of a believer whose body has now been declared by God to be the temple of God. In that passage I just quoted. So I give you a moment. How do I do it? Well, 1 John 1, 9, I chose it. I, I chose that passage in my ministry because of the word cleansing. If, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The word cleansing goes back to verse 7 in the blood of Christ, and it goes to the cross. The cross deals with two issues, the unbeliever and the believer. The blood of Christ deals with the unbeliever and deals with the believer. The blood of Christ. Cleansing. For the unbeliever is from Adamic sin. Wherefore by one man Adam sinned into the world and death by sin is so spread upon all mankind. Therefore all mankind is sinners. Jesus came into the world in 1 Timothy 15. Christ came into the world to save sinners. And so when they believe that Jesus died for their sins, not for his, when he died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, they get saved, what we call being saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. But what that gospel is that Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, when you believe it, the gospel is the power of God to save those who believe, Romans 1, 16. Now, that's one issue. That issue, once you believe it, that cleansing works for your life forever. You have eternal life. It's based on the work and character of Christ, not yours. Now, for the believer, when he gets into carnality and gets personal sin in his life, how does he get back to spirituality? It's not about salvation. It's about being spiritual. That's the word Holy Spirit. The word spirit is where you get spiritual. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. You confess it. You name it. You cite it. You state it to God. You come into an agreement with him that that's sin. How do you know what sin is? You, the Bible tells you. Romans, the third chapter, would be an example of that. So I give you a moment. Mental attitude type of sin, since the tongue of verse sin should be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study so that you could be spiritual, so the Holy Spirit could teach and recall the truth of the word of God from your soul to personal life, the way you live. You live based on what you learn. That's true in the natural man. It's true in the spiritual man. Let's pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. We look at Elijah once again, Father. The drought has been there. He's been prepared for this hour through the drought. God has had him in spiritual camp, getting trained for the Reformation, waiting on a spiritual awakening to happen. He wasn't part of it. But he will be a, a key figure in the spiritual Reformation. And all that time that the drought's been going on, God's been preparing him. And so, Father, this is preparation time. Here we are. We're in the midst of a drought, i.e., in a virus. What is this time for us? It's downtime. Downtime for what? For training for what's coming. Spiritual training, a reformation, a spiritual awakening to a spiritual reformation, a returning to where God is the supreme of one's life, both in the church. and in a nation when it comes to divine institutional thinking. Well, Father, we thank you for these that have come our way to study with us. We pray, Father, today as we look at the beginning of a spiritual reformation, we would get a look at the necessary things. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to look at four things today of the beginning of a spiritual reformation. The crisis the drought crisis that they were in, what kind of result did it have? Was there a spiritual awakening? We're about to find out. If there was a spiritual awakening, how much of a spiritual awakening does it require to have a reformation? 
you will be surprised how little it takes. You would think there would have to be a great spiritual awakening. There has to be a spiritual awakening, but it doesn't have to be great, but it has to be there. You will see in the people when they come to the contest of Mount Carmel, you will get a look at the people under the drought. And, and, and it will be interesting to you and I. You might think that it would just take an awful lot. It doesn't take an awful lot anymore for salvation than it does the Christian life. But it does take a spiritual awakening. You have to become spiritually awakened to the gospel. That Jesus Christ came into the world to die for your sins, to be buried and raised from the dead, to give you life everlasting. And not just life everlasting that says, okay, when I die, I'm going to heaven. But for your life to give substance to other people, the people your life touches, you should be able to touch for eternity. Think about that. Your life in Christ, when it touches other people, can touch them for eternity. When the gospel is shared to them, it takes them into eternity when they believe it. When you share the word of God with other people and give them the truth that could change their life so dramatically, it gives you rewards in heaven. The divine production from the Christian life results in, in crowns and, and rewards. These are eternal things. I think sometimes we miss uh, our journey through life. I think sometimes we miss it. Well, anyhow, here's Elijah, point number one. Elijah has four important meetings which involve the beginning of the spiritual reformation in the North Kingdom. These are discussed in the 18th chapter, 17 through 40. You'll be able to get a chance to look at all that. You'll look at three of them today with me, and then a fourth one next week. Here are the first three meetings that are important to begin a spiritual ref reformation. Elijah, in verses 17 and 18, Elijah has a special meeting with King Ahab and Obadiah. God wants all three. Remember that. Wants all three. He's got to have all three on board for a spiritual reformation. In the second meeting, verses 19 through 23, Elijah meets with the sons of Israel because the king needs the people. The king needs the people. I need to have the support of the people. And so the sons of Israel are going to be assembled, and he's going to get it. In other words, the tribes, the leaders of the tribes are going to gather in a conference, and they're going to agree to do this. In verses 24 through 29, Elijah meets with the 400 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah. That's all under the Baalic, Baal, the, the Phalic cult of Baal. And this, what's going to be presented to them is a national contest. It would be the spiritual Super Bowl at Mount Carmel. Listen to me now. Winner takes all. That's bold. Is that, that, is that bold? Winner take all. Now just look at the numbers in this contest. I got 450 plus 400, that's how many? 850 to what? <laughs> God loves those odds. Now that, those kind of odds would put fear in our heart, wouldn't it? I mean, who, may, who would bet on that? 850 to 1. Huh? You, you may put a dollar on it, but would you put all of your money on it? They're off the racing. Here they go. Sink it all on that? No, you might put a dollar on it. You wouldn't put your whole life living in it. Just think of those odds, because that's, that were the odds. And the fourth time, the fourth meeting, Elijah 
has a second meeting with King Ahab, and the Reformation is in full swing. So it'd be worth your read. Now, one of the things that's interesting in verses 24 through 29, that I'm going to give you a heads up on when we get there, it says that these 850 prophets of idolatry eat at Jezebel's table. Now, what does that mean? Now, there's a lot of people for supper, isn't it? <laughs> Susanna, you like to cook. But that's a, large, that's a large group, isn't it? Well, so what does that mean? Well, it means that they, these 850 ha have her full support, or it means that that's a state-run religion. They are financed through Jezebel. Now, we're going to meet her. We haven't really met her yet. We haven't really met her, but we will meet this lady. You know where she's from? Sidon. And do you know what her background is? Her father, in her life, her father was the priest king. And do you know where these, all of these prophets of Baal are come from? Sidon. Do you remember the widow of Zarephath? She was a Sidonian witch. I, I, I told you that. And I told you there's two women that came out of there really important to this story. The widow who got saved and became a missionary and Jezebel, the child of hell. Now, she was the apple of her father's eye apparently. But for the rest of the kingdom, I mean, this gal killed every prophet in Israel to clear the path for these prophets to come in by a state-supported, guarded, funded Jezebel who is married to the king of Israel. You see those 400 prophets of Asherah? They promoted, listen to me now, demonic sex. This is going to haunt Israel their entire existence because out of that is going to come child sacrifice for sexual pleasure. Their parents are going to sacrifice their children for sexual pleasure. Oh, now you want to read the story, don't you? Yeah, that's a good one. Unless, unless you're the parents and they're the children. This is Jezebel, and they're sitting at her table. They're under her authority. And she carries the weight of the authority. She, listen, she carried enough authority as a wife to the king to kill all the prophets of Israel. And Obadiah hit a hundred of them, or she had got them all. And he was such a good statesman by his lips. He didn't say he was a great statesman. He said, but he got a pass from Ahab because he's such a good statesman. He, oh, but listen, King Ahab needed him because he was a people. He's a statesman of the people. Well, it just becomes an interesting story. It just becomes an interesting Well, when, they, when he, he's going to have another meeting, today's lesson includes the first three meetings of Elijah. Today's lesson is going to take the three, first three meetings on your paper of Elijah. That's going to be 17 through 29 that was part of the very roots or beginning of a spiritual reformation. Point number two. During Elijah's first meeting with King Ahab, Elijah proposed a setting 
a settling of the dispute between the worship of Baal and the worship of God. He said, look, we, we got to settle this. We got to settle it once for all. He proposed a contest between the 850 prophets of Baal and the one prophet of God of Israel. Win or take all. It reminded me when I read this account of David's contest with Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, 8 through 11. Boy, you ought to go back and read that. How bold David was. And boy, when, he, when it came time for him to face off and, 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 and Goliath comes out and tells, tells him what all he's going to do with that young whippersnapper, he's going to teach him a lesson and with it teach Israel a lesson. And, it, and listen, if you read the story of Goliath and David, you remember Goliath came out, win or take all. Remember that? Send me a man out here. If you got one, send me a man. Well, they sent him a boy. And oh, did that tick him off? They sent him a boy. They sent him a, a young teenager. I hope you know that young teenager how important your life is to God. Don't wait to grow up to be a great servant of God. Do it now. There's the story of young David. If you're waiting to have some kind of great ministry and somehow it's going to happen, listen, it happens today or it won't happen later. It happens later because you put the groundwork in. You put the grunt work in now. You begin having a ministry now. You don't wait till you graduate from college. You don't wait till you get in your career. You do it now. You got saved now. Get it now. Well, anyhow, that's the story of David. It's well worth you read. If you're a girl, you ought to consider it as well as a boy. Well, they, they've had this, this first meeting with King Ahab, and he says, Liz, winner take all. As a politician... Ahab needed complete support of this contest with the people, the citizenry. So he called a meeting of the sons of Israel, the tribal leaders, and received complete support for it. Winner take all. Let's get this thing done now. That was Elijah's idea. King Ahab supported it. He's called a meeting of the sons of Israel, the tribal leaders, and we're about to have it. All sides agreed to the contest between 800 prophets of Baal versus one prophet of God of Israel to meet at Mount Carmel. Now, what's important about Mount Carmel is this. That was the holy mountain of the, of the prophets of Baal. In other words, that's field advantage. That's home advantage in sports. Would you agree with that? Well, they, listen, in football, they... they depending on how much, how close the two teams are, home field is three points, right? As a rule, you got all your fans, and if you serve beer, you know. Well, anyhow, I don't know. I'm not that, I'm not that big on point spreads and all that kind of stuff, but... I know you have a home advantage. Everybody talks about it, whether it's basketball, baseball, football, whatever it is. You have home advantage. So he, he says, listen, I'll meet you on your mountain. That's really important to how the first contest, how this thing goes. Well, I got to thinking about this. I got to think about this, and I thought to myself, how would Las Vegas bet? After Jezebel had earlier murdered all the prophets but a hundred who were in hiding, would that be would that be something the betters might betters at Las Vegas might consider? Well, I think it might. I, I also wondered if the fact that God will not remove the drought until the contest is over, if that would affect the betting. You suppose it would? Yeah, yeah it might. Might. Because this is how it's going to run. Now I wondered 
if the fact that God will, God would, would it matter to the betters to know that Baal worship was forbidden by God of Israel in Deuteronomy 16, 21, and 22? I wonder if it would matter to the better if they knew that the God of Israel had forbidden this whole deal. Well, it depends on how much you believe about the God of Israel, doesn't it? If you believe he's supreme, you're going to put your, all your money on him. Because that would be a big deal for the better on the Israel side, would it not be? <laughs> and the drought, would that not be a big bet for them? Nah. And winner take all, do they have a history of winner take all and the winner took all? Oh, yeah, they got David. And they got others, you know, they got the whole story of the Exodus, right? I'm just thinking, this is the kind of stuff that runs through my mind every once in a while when, I, when I'm studying all this. How big is this contest to the priest nation of Israel? Well, we'll find out. But how big is it? I mean, really, I should ask maybe how important is it? Now, they've all signed off to see this contest. They all signed off to see the contest. Winner take all. That bothers me. <laughs> that bothers me with the Israelites. That bothers me a little. That bothers me a little, and I'll talk about it in a moment. Point number three. The contest is completely spiritual. You got the prophets over here and the prophet over here, and that's spiritual. You got the gods over here, and you got the God over here. That's spiritual, ain't it? It is part of the spiritual warfare, by the way, angelic conflict, of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10 through 17. Let me show you something. I want you to look at Ephesians a moment. The sixth chapter, verse 10. Now, you know this. I'm not going to read all the thing, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but I want to mention one verse in a spiritual warfare. It's how Paul opens up, put on the full armor of God, verse 10. Before he tells you anything about the spiritual warfare, he gives you a doctrinal principle that's got to work in your life or the warfare is not going to work proper. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. The other night, I was in an all-nighter with my wife going through suffering. And she had a lot of questions about why and how much and And I don't have the strength. I don't have the will. I am exhausted from pain. What do I do, Ron? I told her this is a spiritual war. It's called the angelic conflict, which she knows in her mind because she's been taught through this church. This is spiritual war. And Satan has permission to buffet your body. That's put pain on you. And I'm going to tell you why. It's for his glory. How can he, she asked, how could he possibly get glory out of my pain. It's because it's how you rest in his grace. While you're being buffeted by the devil and the forces of evil of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, 10 through 17, your responsibility 
is to put your rest, your faith, rest, to put your faith in God Almighty. And when you do, while the enemy is attacking you and you do that, you will find peace in the midst of that storm in your life. And God will be glorified in the angelic warfare. Do you hear me? See, this passage becomes reality in a guy like me who has to walk his wife through it. So how is she going to do that? Listen to me. It's what I tell her. Be strong in the Lord in the strength of his might. Is that not a promise? And that's how we get through the day and the night. And that's how you bring glory to God. That's how you bring glory to God. In the angelic world. Nobody else may know that. That war goes on at 1 o'clock and 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock and 4 o'clock and 5 o'clock in the morning. Nobody else may ever know that except God Almighty in the angelic world. It's, an, it's a spiritual war. You got to read for, in Ephesians 6. You got to read verse 11 and 12. And God is glorified. And how is she going to find that to do that in the midst of that pain? How is she going to do that? Going to be strong. Going to be strong in her faith to what's going on in the midst of her life. And she's going to find the strength from the Lord. Let me tell you, he never fails you. Never fails you. He never fails you. I don't know how personal these kind of things get in your life. I can only know how personal they get in mine, and so I share them with you. God did it with all the guys in the Bible. So I share it with you. For one day, you may be going through it, or maybe you're going through it now, or you have gone through it, or whatever. How does this thing work in the mechanics of your life? How does it actually work? This is how it works. This is spiritual war. This, this is a spiritual war that's going on. In 1 Kings 18, verse 24, he says, Then you will call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he is God, winner take all. And all the people, Israelites, said, This is a good idea. Now, that bothers me. So I have to take a better look at that because that bothers me. Well, it's a good idea. Now, I, I was expecting 1 John 4, 5, 4. Faith is a victory that overcomes. That's what I was looking for. But what I got was a watered-down idea. I got, guys in, I got guys in the bleachers who have no skin in the game. They're willing to go whatever way this goes. They put no skin in the game. You know who's got skin in the game? Elijah. Obadiah. These two guys have stuck their neck out there. For God. People think it's a good idea to have a contest, winner take all. Gee whiz. I mean, if that's based on absolute faith, very good, because that's what Elijah's got in Obadiah. That's what they got. But I'm looking at a group of people who are spectators. They just want the crisis to go away, get back to their normal life, which is ho-hum anyhow. 
If you think you're going to get, listen, everybody's talking about a new normal. The church better know one. You don't want to go back to where we were. You do not want to go back to where we were. This crisis is from God. You don't want to go back to where you were. You were with nothing. The church, listen, the church set an idol with people under it. Not backing up or going forward. World underneath the bus. We need a new normal. We need a spiritual awakening within the church for reform. And when I talk of reform, I'm talking about the Luther type. Where the church comes back to the word of God and the work of God and does it properly. We've set whole home. We've become spectators. Well, how would you like, well, I hope the virus goes well. If it does, I don't know. It's, uh, you wait for a virus? You waiting for a vaccine? Tell me, are you waiting for a vaccine? When they finally get one, do you know how hard it's going to sell the people on a vaccine? Except those who are really sick. No, we can't get people to take a flu shot. And a flu shot, if you don't get a flu shot, you could get pneumonia, same age group. I did statistics. I went down and got it. And I got the pneumonia shot. You know why? Because I'm in the age group. I went statistically on it. I just went statistically. <laughs> I don't know. It's your life. You should be able to have to choose to do what you want with it or not. But as a spiritual person, you need to think about what God wants out of you. What does God want out of you? I hope not a, the normal. I hope not normal. Because that normal wasn't good. It wasn't good for my church. It was not good for my church. The one I pastor, when I say my church. I mean the one I pastor. The contest was designed by God to bring the pre people from a spiritual awakening, the drought, to a spiritual reformation, a turning away from idolatry, worship of Baal, and returning back to the worship of the God of Israel, the Lord God Almighty, the God who has a long history of faithfulness to the priest nation. This virus thing is God, and what is it about? It's about his church. It's always about his church. We live in the church age. My goodness, of course it is. Point number four. Aren't you glad? <laughs> I will send you home in a minute. The rules of the contest. The one is we're going to meet on Mount Carmel, your mountain. That was their sacred mountain. Now the rules. The rules are laid out and the prophets of Baal are allowed to go first because they have the large number and it's home advantage. Right? You can read about that in verses 25 through 29. This should be a sure bet, and it should be over quick. This should be a sure bet, and it ought to be over quick. <laughs> On their mount, holy mountain, 850 to 1, you go first. You kick the field goal, you win. Kind of thing. You know, you get the first shot, then we get a shot. Eh. Rules of the contest. They were told to choose one ox and prepare for a sacrificial offering. Both sides would do that at the proper time. They go first. Choose one ox, prepare for sacrificial offering. Number two, call on the name of your God. Number three, put no fire under it under the offering. Let's see if your God can do that. 
That's in verses 25 and 26 of our lesson. And so the first exercise, the prophets of Baal are up. 850 of them. They go first. Home advantage. The first exercise, they go normal worship. They do their whole home Sunday meeting. They do their normal worship of Baal from morning to noon to lunch and receive no answer. You can read about that in verses 26 and 27. They shouted all, all morning, Oh, Baal, answer us. Oh, Baal, answer us. He doesn't answer. So in verse 27, Elijah says, Maybe Baal has been preoccupied with something. Maybe he's gone to the bathroom. That's gone aside. You got to live in a culture with outdoor Johns and corn cobs to understand this. Maybe he's going on a journey. Maybe he's taking some time off and going on a journey. Maybe he's asleep. You haven't been able to wake him up. So he recommends that they, they holler more and do more stuff. And so after lunch, they come back. And after lunch until evening offering, which they still have on the altar, they have a fit. They dance they holler, they cut themselves and bleed blood all over the altar all day long. They use their blood to think that will entice Baal. That shows you how crazy these people are. Israel knows it's the blood of Christ. Most of them that are attending have forgotten that. bunch of people trying to save themselves and save their day and save their face. They spill their own blood. Certainly, Baal will take notice when human blood is on the altar. No response. When that day's over, there was no answer. Verse 28, no answer. <laughs> they offered their own blood, no answer. And the, the camera switches from the prophets of Baal. Now listen to me. The camera shoots to the crowd. And the Bible says the people were absolutely bored to death. They're sleeping. They're, they're still eating. They're chat, talking. They're playing cards. I don't know what they do. But they are bored That was the second exercise. The second exercise regarded extreme worship and still no answer. And next time, we'll see the next team come up. One guy, one Lord, and it's going to be enough. So let me return to where I started in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. We not lose our place as a church. Now, these things happened as an example for us, church age believers, so that we would not crave evil things as they also cra craved. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Again, now these things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instructions upon whom the ends of the ages have come. That's the church. Watch the two therefores. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall or fail. Doctrinal principle. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as common to man. 
But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted to beyond what you are able, Romans 4.21, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 20. They sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. See, that's what their side is all about. I want to close with 1 Samuel 17, 47. I wrote it on your paper late. To remind you, David. David says, I'm going to put you down today. He says to Goliath, today is the worst day of your life. Because the God of Israel will own this day. At the end of this day, the God of Israel will own it. Here's what he said. And that all of this assembly... The sons of Israel gathered to watch winner take all, that all of this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by swords or spears, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And God, wonderful. This is a God of your life. It's a God of mine. Listen, he's going, to, he's going to squeeze your life so that you see the reality of who God really is in your life. Is he the big deal or not? Make that journey while you have the time and the comfort to do it. Now is the time you learn it. So when that time comes, you have it well established in your soul and the journey through that is much easier. Let us pray. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace that has prayed, prepared us for this virus crisis as a church to bring a spiritual awakening for a spiritual reformation. We don't want to go back the way we were. It brought the virus. We want to, we want to go to a new normal, a high spiritual where we begin winning people to the Lord Jesus Christ because we share the gospel to them and we disciple them to do it to others. We teach them the truth of the word of God, how to live, not only to believe, but how to suffer for Christ's sake. These are the people we should be. We should be reaching communities for Jesus Christ on a worldwide basis. We've become spectators and not participators. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.